A few weeks ago, I did a, uh, a first part message on the glory of the night watch. And uh, part of my goal in this is one is to help us kind of understand through the word uh, the significance of the night watch. Number one, number two is to, I'm unashamedly aiming for anyone in this room who will get hit with an arrow to go, huh, maybe I should go do it for a season. But thirdly, but for the rest of us to say, you know what, no, I don't think that I'm going to go to Night Watch, but to understand that as a community together, uh, we have a responsibility when it comes to the stewardship of nine-day prayer. And what makes it nine-day prayer is the Night Watch. And that, so the, the entrustment to, to strengthen it, uh, to encourage it, to support it, is really the, the, uh, the privilege and the invitation to all of us, uh, whether we are on the night watch or, or not. Now, in Luke 18, verse 8, you know, Jesus uh, tells the story of the persistent widow, and he ends the, uh, uh, the parable with a question. And the question is, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And so he gives this parable about night and day prayer, and he ends it with this question. And you've heard me say this before, you know, when Jesus asks a question, um, that means school is in session. Because he is not looking for information, he, he's, he's communicating something. And what we see is that when we look at Luke 17, the chapter before, and connected with Luke 18, is that there is a, uh, there's a deep connection between the unfolding of the generation in which the Lord returns and the emerging of nine-day prayer across the nations. Uh, we've had nine-day prayer emerge throughout history, but more and more the, the earth, the church in the whole world, is getting awakened to this reality and different pockets are beginning to emerge to the earth of people giving themselves a nine-day prayer. And I believe that, that, that nine-day prayer, the emerging of it, is actually one of the signs of the time. It is an indicator that the Lord is about to do something of significance uh, in the nations. But what makes nine-day prayer night and day really is the night watch. And in, in fact... When the Lord said, I will set watchmen on the wall, and they will cry out day and night in Isaiah 61, in my opinion, in essence, he was saying, I'm going to establish the night watch. Because uh, in general, day, corporate day prayer is, is common. Afternoon corporate prayer is common. Even evening prayers, uh, corporate evening prayers are common. But the, but the night reality, uh, through the night intercession, it's, it's happening more and more, but that was not the common reality. And so when the Lord says, I'm going to establish watchmen, he, I believe in a significant way, he's saying, I'm going to establish the night watch. Uh, making the night watch, as it were, really the main event of the night and day reality. Uh, when talking about nine-day prayer, what we do here when I talk to different people, uh, people that I meet for the first time, whatnot, uh, the thing that surprises them the most is the fact that there is worship and intercession taking place at one, two, four, three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. And so that's the thing that uh, that people are alerted by. Now, paragraph A, in Joel chapter one, or well, actually Joel chapter two, excuse me, uh, it's a familiar passage. Joel chapter two, verses twelve to fifteen. It is, the, um, it is the call to solemn assemblies. Paragraph A, the solemn assemblies are uh, the church gathering corporately uh, to contend for the perhaps of God. What is happening in Joel is the prophet Joel, he is prophesying about a crisis in his generation, and he is prophesying about the fullness of this crisis emerging in the generation of the Lord's return in the day of the Lord. And he's, and, he, and, he's, uh, and he's prophesying that if the people of God in geographical regions were to turn to him with all their heart, that the perhaps of God would break out, where the mercy of God will be released in certain geographical areas uh, to, uh, to restrain, as it were, uh, the judgments of the Lord. In Joel chapter 2 specifically, um, he's talking about the Antichrist and his armies moving across the nations. And, and Joel is prophesying that, that as the church gathers together in solemn assemblies, turning to the Lord with all their heart, which is really uh, establishing the first commandment in their hearts, 
and, and understanding that he is gracious and compassionate. So it is this first commandment that is fueled by the understanding of God's love. And that in that place, beginning to cry out for the mercy of God, that perhaps the Lord would break in and leave a blessing behind. So solemn assemblies, they are the church gathering corporately, contending for the perhaps of God by the people of God turning to the Lord with all their heart and experience the love of God and get themselves to the place of intercession. Paragraph B, uh, the book of Joel, this three-chapter prophecy this, uh, called the Minor Prophet, um, we want to become familiar with this book in this hour. Again, um, different ones over the years, Mike in particular and Gore and Alan all also over the years have talked much about um, the, the, uh, the book of Joel, and of course, and Seabet, so Mike uh, taught the 150 chapters. Again, there's information out there and on the internet as well. I want to encourage us to, uh, to become familiar with the message of the prophet Joel. Because again, uh, two weeks ago, when talking about nine-day prayer, the connection between nine-day prayer and the unique dynamics of the Lord's return, they are deeply linked together. The, the, uh, the emerging of nine-day prayer in the earth without connecting it with God's end time or eschatological activities really doesn't make sense. And part of the fuel of nine-day prayer is understanding the dynamics of the Lord's return. And the prophet Joel is one of those very one, two, three books that it's really, really important for us to become familiar with. The paragraph C Joel chapter 1, just a real brief outline, Joel chapter 1 verse 1 to Joel chapter 2 verse 11 addresses the reality of a coming crisis in Joel's day, but it has full expression of that crisis in the generation in which the Lord returns. Verse 11, he talks about the day of the Lord, this, uh, this eschatological event of the Lord's return. And so Joel, Joel is prophesying about both of these realities. He's, again, he's ultimately prophesying about the eschatological crisis that will touch the nation of Israel as well as the rest of the world. And all the nations will encounter this dilemma. All the nations will encounter this dilemma. I think last uh, Sunday, uh, and uh, that was part of Isaac's message, was about the snare that it will touch the whole earth. This is inescapable. Every nation, tribe, and tongue will be affected by this reality. What well, Joel goes on to say in Joel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, he says that God has a prescribed remedy for the crisis. He, he doesn't leave us without answers. And it is, the Solomon, it is the church embracing her identity as a solemn assembly of turning to the Lord, experiencing the love of God, and crying out in intercession for the breakthrough of God, the perhaps of God, uh, 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 to, to break in in the midst of the crisis. So that's Joel chapter 2, verse uh, 12 to 17. And then in Joel chapter 2, verse 18 to 31, what we see there is, the, is God gives us a promise of an historic breakthrough of God in response to the intercession of the saints. And so again, Joel chapter 1, verse 1 uh, to 2.11, we see the, uh, the eschatological crisis that would touch the whole earth. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17 is God's divine remedy, solemn assemblies. In Joel chapter 2, verse 18 to 31, we see the promise of, a, of, a, of an historic uh, Holy Spirit breakthrough in power in the nations and ultimately the nation of Israel. Now, at the center stage of this uh, global crisis is the most horrifically demonized evil man uh, uh, known as the Antichrist. And he will uh, develop and lead a worldwide network of governments, finance, religion, and military. And, the, and, and, the, and, and, and this time period is also known as the Great Tribulation. And the Great Tribulation consists, however, of the release of God's uh, judgments and the release of God's glory. And so there are uh, uh, positive and negative dimensions. That's kind of hard to say that God does negative dimensions. But, but, they are, but there is trouble that will touch the earth in, in unprecedented ways. And there's glory that will come in and through the church in unprecedented ways during the uh, Great Tribulation. And it's partly in response, if not entirely in response, I believe, to the churches having embraced her identity as a solemn assembly and crying out for the purposes of God in the nations of the earth. 
In paragraph E, now what's the purpose of the Great Tribulation? Well, there's several purposes. One, it is to bring in the, the great harvest, um, including the salvation of the Jewish people. During the Great Tribulation, it's about the inbreaking of the harvest, including the salvation of the Jewish people. I want to say this, that um, I want to encourage us to add this to our thought process because as I listen to people when they talk about the Great Tribulation, there is no evangelistic vision. I want to say this very clearly. There will be evangelism happening in a way that we cannot even begin to fathom during the Great Tribulation. And it will be with great power. Great power. Micah chapter 7 verse 15 the prophet prophesies that as in the days of Moses, I will show them wonders. It is the same power realm, so to speak, but multiplied at, 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 uh, at greater intensity and scope as he did in the days of Exodus, will be released in the nations of the earth as well as the power dimensions of the book of Acts that will be multiplied in its scope and its intensity that will be released in the nations of the earth, but it will be in part in the context of the preaching of the gospel. Getting a little quiet there. You know, really, we were, again, the, the, the church will operate in the fullness of what she is called to operate in, both in love and unity with one another, but a bright, shining witness of power, the gospel. I'm, I'm very tempted to go there right now. I'm just going to I'm not going to. <laughs> And so the purpose of the great tribulation is the great harvest, including the salvation of Jewish people, the vindication of righteousness, expose false believers within the church, again, demonstrate God's power in protecting the saints, though there will be martyrdom at a great scale, but there will be also a tremendous amount of uh, 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 testimonies and stories of God's supernatural intervention in protecting the saints, to punish sin, to purge the earth from defilement of sin, as the earth is getting prepared to, uh, to receive the next age, the millennium. Paragraph G, actually paragraph F, an IPKC is a community that exists to partner in a great commission by advancing nine-day prayer with worship and to, and to proclaim the beauty of Jesus and his glorious return. And by the grace of God, we'll be doing this through that time period, the proclamation of Jesus and his beauty and his glorious return. And that includes the, the unique dynamics at the end of the age. That's our mission statement. Let's go to page two. Now, in Joel chapter one, when we talk about solemn assemblies, the, naturally the focus is on chapter two, and that makes sense because that's where solemn assemblies are mentioned. However, there is a little verse in a chapter before that I, that I think is to be connected with these solemn assemblies that are mentioned in Joel chapter 2. And that is Joel chapter 1 verse 13, where the prophet calls the priest to cry out to the Lord and to minister to the Lord in the night. In the night. There is a night watch component to these solemn assemblies that Joel prophesies about in Joel chapter 2. Again, in 1982 in Cairo, Egypt, we know the story when the Lord uh, spoke and uh, said that he was going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the whole earth in one generation. And in that encounter, one of the hard values that the Lord highlighted was this issue of night and day prayer that he would give grace for nine-day prayer, that he would establish nine-day prayer um, here in Kansas City and, again, in all the other nations of the earth. And, again, as I mentioned earlier, that, again, the, but, but what makes it night and day is the establishing of the night watch, paragraph B. Again, the night watch is essential to the establishing of night and day solemn assemblies. So, in a lot of ways, one reason I'm talking about this is because as a spiritual family, with our 24-7, nine-day prayer with worship, we are more than a worship center. We actually are a perpetual solemn assembly. And that's why this is important, that we are a perpetual 
solemn assembly, operating in the spirit of Joel 1 and Joel 2. And what Joel 1 tells us is that in that solemn assembly, in this case in the perpetual solemn assembly, is the issue of the night watch. Number one, number two, the solemn assemblies in Joel, they are being raised up in the context of the eschatological landscape of the earth changing. That we're living in a unique day and in a unique hour where the day of the Lord is approaching. And it's in light of that that the Lord is establishing these, these, uh, sol uh, these perpetual solemn assemblies. And number three, that again, our understanding from the scripture concerning the unique dynamics at the end of the age is essential to strengthening and understanding the assignment that the Lord has given us and many other groups in the nations of the earth. So the night watch is essential to establishing these uh, night and day solemn assemblies. And I believe that before the Lord returns that millions, I want to say this again, millions of men and women, I really believe this, young and old, married, single, with children, without children, intercessors, they will stand by night in the house of the Lord. Millions will do this before the Lord returns. I believe, I'm believing for several thousand here in Kansas City, as in terms of the local expression, several thousand, I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, Lord says, you know, for, for whatever amount that he's prophesied, the 5,000, the 10,000, the 15,000, the 25,000, I've asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I want 25% of that number in the night. I mean, a quarter of all the numbers that have been prophesied, if one number is 300,000, imagine 25% of that 300,000 standing in the night, contending for God's divine purposes in the city, in the nation, in the nations of the earth, and ultimately God's purposes in the nation of Israel. There will be thousands, again, who will participate in the local expression in this reality here in Kansas City. And that is part of what uh, these, these sessions are about. It's about putting before us this reality of the night watch and where I believe the Lord wants to take this with us, uh, for us in, uh, in our midst, even in this city. Paragraph C. The Holy Spirit is raising up a company, worship leaders, singers, musicians, intercessors, forerunner messengers, teachers, who will embrace what I like to call the wilderness lifestyle of the night watch and become an engaged servant community. Single people don't get too excited about the word engaged. Let me break that down for you. No. <laughs> okay, excuse me. No. <laughs> In Psalm 134, which we're looking at in just a few moments, the first verse is a call to behold and bless. It is a call to be engaged with God and ministering to him. Number one. Number two, in verses two, one and two of Psalm 134, this company of people, they're called servants. So they are an engaged servant. And then they're a community, because in verse three, the blessing of the Lord coming out of Zion, as we talked a couple weeks ago about this call to interdependence, that it is actually a call to community to be a part of the night watch, not in terms of the night watch community, but to, uh, but to learn how to lean on the entire community in which the night watch exists. And so I call the night watch an engaged servant community.
So the Spirit, he is raising up a community in the, night, in the watches of the night across the nations and in this city. And uh, <clears throat> what they would do is they will contend for the mercy of God concern, considering the coming crisis. It strikes me interesting that uh, in Joel, he, uh, he says that these intercessors, they will cry out for mercy. They would say, Lord, would you have mercy on your people? And what's interesting about that is that um, over the last 20 years, what I've observed just in prayer meetings, just in general, is how there's been an increase of a cry for justice. The cry for justice has been getting louder, um, r- louder than the cries for mercy. And, um, and yet the prophet says, no, these intercessors, they will cry out for the mercy of God. Number two, uh, this community in the watches of the night, they will contend for the realm of prophetic revelation to break in to the watches of the night. One of the prayers that uh, uh, we used to pray in the night was often was asking the Lord to change the dream life of the region in which we're in. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 2, night unto night reveals knowledge. That the dream life of the city would be changed because there are men and women contending for the release of God's purposes in the night. Paragraph E. Paul refers to the end of human history as the night and the coming day as the inbreaking of the next age. And so the presence of the night watch, it, it points to this cry emerging at the end of natural history. And so the emerging of the night watch, they're contending for the release of mercy. They're contending for the release of the prophetic spirit. And they are also raising up a prophetic banner as a sign, as an indicator that we're living in an hour that the bridegroom is about to do something of significance. It's page Let's go go ahead and turn to Psalm 134. Page 3 in Psalm 134 in your Bibles. I've always found it interesting that there is an entire chapter in the Psalms that is dedicated to the night watch. I think that is significant. The Lord is the author of Scripture. He's very intentional in what he put within the Word of God. And he, in his perfect wisdom, thought it was necessary to have a, a three-verse chap, three chapter focused on the night watch, Psalm 134. I was believed that this chapter was sung. It was a song that was sung by the daytime uh, to strengthen the night watch. The night watch is a call to interdependence. When the Lord issues, uh, uh, where, where the Lord uh, uh, issues his strength to the night, through the community that they are a part of. The night watch cannot function properly without the support of the entire community. I'll say this again. The night watch cannot function properly without the support of the entire community. Paragraph B, the psalmist uh, exhorts the night watchers to behold and to bless the Lord. And so the psalmist, he's stirring up the priests, the intercessors, the worshipers, who stand by night to be vigilant and watchful. And one of the reasons for this is that just even physiologically, uh, being up at night, it just naturally lends itself to our bodies just being more relaxed. 
There's all kinds of physiological things that take place. And so the, and so the, 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 the temptation for idleness is very, very uh, near uh, to those who stand by night. And so the daytime is telling the night watch, hey, no, keep the charge. Keep the charge. The Lord has given us an assignment. Keep the charge. We're counting on you. Keep the charge. Uh, keep the charge. Stay the course. Stay focused. Behold, bless the Lord. Actively engage your heart and your mind uh, 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 with the Word and with the presence of God and and connecting with His beauty and speaking words to Him. That is the charge of the night watch being given by the daytime. And so He's stirring up these intercessors to be vigilant and to be watchful. Paragraph C, I believe that Psalm 134 is strategically placed in the Word of God by the Lord for at least three reasons. Number one, clearly as an assignment for the night watch to give themselves to the Lord. Secondly, as an exhortation to the daytime to be involved in strengthening the night watch. And thirdly, that it can serve as a blueprint of how to build a community that sustains night and day prayer of which the night watch is the main event. And so as we begin to look at Psalm 134, meditate on Psalm 134, I, I believe the Lord wants to give us insight it, it, uh, it, it, because it can serve as a blueprint of how to build our infrastructure even that will strengthen a night and day prayer. Paragraph D. Verse 1, Psalm 134, verse 1, it is the mandate and the vision of the night watch to behold and to bless the Lord. Verse 2, the, the necessity of a lifestyle to economize our strength. It talks about lifting our hands in the sanctuary. It is a charge to the night watch. Hey, come to the night watch with strength. And so there's lots of different challenges that, uh, that come with that. And then thirdly, the life flow of God to the individual and the community in the night that comes through Zion. Paragraph E, the primary mandate and exhortation in Iowa is to behold, to deliberately engage our minds and to, and to consider and to gaze on the Lord. In Psalm 119, verse 48, I love this. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. There's many, many verses in the Psalms that talk about the watches of the night and engaging with the Lord with the word, engaging with the Lord in worship, engaging with the Lord in prayer. Paragraph F, the night watch is a, a picture and a call to extravagant devotion. Mary is to us this picture of extravagant devotion, extravagant devotion that is costly, but the very mention of the cost is just like, ah, it's like don't even, mention, don't even mention the cost, but yet at the same time, it is costly. It is costly physically. It is costly emotionally. It's costly socially. It's costly uh, insofar as time. And again, in each one of these points, uh, um, I could break down in terms of how that is, that it's costly. But... I can't but help to think of Mary in John chapter 12, verse 3, where she broke the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the costly spikenard. She, uh, she broke the vial on Jesus' feet. And when, she, and when she broke out that vial, the entire house was filled with the fragrance of her devotion. And I believe that that is part of the, the assignment of the night watch because the call to behold the Lord... It's a call that is given to every believer. This is not unique to the night watch. But the Lord in his wisdom, he has given different assignments in the body of Christ to strengthen the entire body of Christ in that which we're called to do. And so as the night watch is strengthened to give themselves to behold and bless the Lord, I believe there's a grace that will come to us in an increased way for us to continue to do our assignment before the Lord to gaze upon his beauty, Psalm 27.4. Page four, verse two, to love the Lord your God with all your strength. And Psalm 134, verse two, is that to lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Again, it's the call to actively engage our minds and hearts in the night. The nighttime can lend itself to idleness. I read that in the book somewhere. I've been told stories of, 
minister to a few young people. <laughs> no, I <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's, it's very, very real. And again, hence the charge to behold and to bless the Lord. Uh, it, the night, in it, just the, by virtue of it, doesn't lend itself to productivity during those hours. And the night hours are the times when our minds and our bodies naturally rest and relax. You have to understand this. The, being on the night watch, here's one of the dynamics is that the vast majority of your life is in the evening hours and in the night hours. Those are the two most idle windows in our culture. And so you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, some hours are going, <laughs> okay, anyway. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and between 3 and since you got three hours of afternoon, and at 6 o'clock, boom, you enter into the most socially idle window in our culture. And then you have to manage that for six hours to then go into the, the next phase of idleness within the culture, which is from midnight to 6. And so Psalm 134 says, no. Resist the idleness and engage with the Lord. Engage with his word. If I was to give a practical exhortation to those in the daytime, um, don't just check out at 6 o'clock, think you're done with IHOP. There, there is a whole other group of people that are waging this war from 6 to midnight. Invite them into your Bible studies. Invite them into your friendship groups. Invite them into whatever departmental activities that you may have going on uh, in the evenings to actually help wage the war against the idleness of the evening so that they can have a vibrant spirit going into midnight and engage the Lord from midnight to six and do all the other things that are taking place in the night watch during that time. Again, as I mentioned the other day, it's one of the things that actually touched me. I mentioned, I don't want to embarrass him, but it's one thing that touched me about Dave Slyker. One of the things I've appreciated about his friendship is just how he, in, in my relationship with him, he just so often, you know, he took care of his family, did whatever he did, but just time and time again made time to, to touch base with me in the evening, uh, in, uh, in the evening times. Now, there were times when I had plenty of stuff to do and was busy and da 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 but there were just times where I just had to have some kind of a social connect with a friend. And there are a whole, there's a whole group in the Night Watch, and we're, the numbers are small now, but the Lord is going to bring an increase. And there is an assignment, I believe, on the rest of the house to be mindful of this group. And this is going to challenge us on lots of different fronts. I was thinking this morning about the Lord's word. I'm going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity. Beloved, do you have any idea what he said when he said that? We find so much safety in the way that we think. And he basically is saying, look, I'm going to mess with your safety. I'm going to mess with your comfort. I'm going to cause you to change the way that you think. The way you think, and yes, family is absolute paramount. He goes, but I'm going to show you a different way forward that is according to my way without violating my value for your family and your children. The night watch is of need of the entire community to rally around them, not just rally around them in terms of, hey, bro, I love you, but no, but actually with time, with energy, and money doing it together. Set the worship team come up. I'm done. <laughs> in, the, in the famous words of Michael Leroy Bickle, you can read the rest of the notes. I'm not going to go through them. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, all, let's all just stand for a moment. 